Morning. Uh, when I got into networking about 13 years ago now, uh, I thought this is kind of what I'd, you know, my daily life would be like. I thought I'd be falling asleep at my desk, uh, maybe working in a noisy data center. And those things do both happen quite a bit. However, at the time, I, I didn't really understand anything about this IoT term that was going to become so popular, uh, but I got thrown into it. Canada is the world's largest producer of potash which is mostly found in Saskatchewan. Well, a couple of words a lot of you maybe have never heard of. Um, potash is a, is a potassium salt. It's one of the major components in fertilizer. It grows food all over the world for um, you know, people everywhere. It's, it's, it's a really important part of, of how we grow our crops. This is a miner or a borer, uh, which is the vehicle that actually digs potash out of the earth. So what was happening was that control systems, uh, belts, valves, pumps, used to run proprietary buses and connectors and they were starting to become IP enabled and run on ethernet. And at the same time, a lot of our IP uh, devices were moving out into the control domains as well. So I'll just share with you a quick kind of view of what it looks like when I go deploy Wi-Fi underground. A little different. This is a potash mine. Uh, this is the view of the surface operations from the top of the tailings pile, which is a giant pile of salt, effectively, of the leftovers that they don't want. We'll see a picture here in a second. Um, we are just finishing up, actually, an outdoor Wi-Fi implementation on this site. Uh, it was interesting, but we did use Ekahau to model uh, the predictive survey there, you see. Here's another look. You can see the two red head frames in the picture there, which uh, sit over top of the mine shaft. That's all the, that's basically the big elevator that takes everything in and out of the mine. And the raw ore bins here at the back of the site. Bear in mind that everything that goes in or comes out of the mine goes through those head frames down those shafts. Here's just a shot of that tailings pile quickly that has been growing there for about 30 years. Giant pile of salt that's just been accumulating. We do have Wi-Fi in the mill. Here's kind of a shot of that. It's a bit of a horror show as far as Wi-Fi comes. Um, and there's potash dust everywhere. That bar right in the middle of the picture is a handrail and it's yellow when you brush it off at least. Here's an access point in the mill that I've just brushed off all of the potash dust. Uh, what had happened here was that the engineers had actually forgotten where all the APs were in the mill. Sometimes they're several stories high mounted up. You can't see them, especially when they're in these boxes that look like everything else, and when uh, they get covered in potash dust. So we were actually walking around with an air check playing hot and cold doing Location, oh, there's one of your APs for documentation. This is a brand new head frame. This head frame is actually 10 miles, pretty well on the nose, which is about 16 kilometers for us people with rational mathematics. Uh, <laughs> and exactly 10 miles, it's just an even number, that's why I use that one. Uh, from the old head frames that we saw, they've dug so far underground that it started to make more sense for them to sink a new shaft and go down there, rather than go down and drive. So here is what it looks like when we get down underground. On the side closest to me, here, well, I guess on the right, is the new mine shaft underneath that cement head frame. Uh, on the far side is the old one. Okay. The shaft is about 1,000 meters deep, which is about 3280 feet. And the ride takes about three minutes, which is still three minutes in Imperial. Uh, um, <laughs> it's a bit of a slow start. We get near free fall part way through and during the middle. And usually we have a pretty soft landing at the end. You do see on the new head frame, uh, the groundwater seeps into the shaft and we get these salt sickles on the cage at the bottom. It kind of looks like it's been there old, longer than it has been. That, that frame is only about four years old. And we have a parking lot underground. Jeeps, uh, Toyota pickup trucks, um, little cub cars without windshields. Again, think about how these get down into the mine. So everything goes down those shafts. In this case, they grab them by the back frame and just lower them down. Um, yeah, everything goes down those mine shafts. So then we drive, we still drive. Uh, real exciting stuff. All of the vehicles have governors in them to limit speeds. Safety is taken very seriously. They do not mess around in any way, shape or form. So we can't drive more than about 30 kilometers an hour or 20 miles an hour. Because if you don't have a windshield, you don't want to hit an underground moose doing a full 50 kph. Eh? It's a bad Canadian joke. 
This is a rock bolt. Uh, when you see them, they're about this long. It's like a railway tire, a big piece of iron. They jam it in to the rock, because when we dig rock out, we relieve a lot of pressure. Uh, so the rock has the potential, at least, to heave. Right? So these are placed for additional um, structural support. Here's just kind of a shot of an overhang. You can see some more rock bolts there. In some places, in some mines, there are hundreds of these everywhere. You can't, you can't look in a direction without seeing rock bolts. In other mines, you can't look a direction with seeing a rock bolt. There's none. So I still have yet to kind of decide whether I'm more comfortable with seeing hundreds of these everywhere I go or in the places where I see absolutely none. I'm not sure if I'll ever decide on that. Go back to the old-fashioned method. Oh, we're skipping ahead. Okay, when I'm underground, I'm always carrying an emergency air supply with me. 20 minutes of air, so I have 20 minutes to get to a refuge station in the event of an emergency that has never happened to me. It has happened in the decade that I've been working with the mines. They're usually, you know, usually there's no loss of life, nobody gets hurt, very precautionary. Again, we take safety very, very seriously, but I do have 20 minutes of air with me at all times. Like everything else, the air that we normally breathe goes in and out of those mine shafts. So it, it, it can be constrained if there's a problem. In newer areas, they put up walls, they build rooms, form substations, so we have air conditioning, you know, uh, filtered air even, so we're not breathing the dust, which is just a nuisance anyway, there's no health damage there. Um, I want to say the air conditioning, good lighting, right? The only thing we don't have underground is running water. So we take drugs with us to drink, and there are porta potties underground everywhere. Um, and those get emptied once a week, and everything gets trucked back up the mine shaft. So you tend to learn which day of the week is the last day of the week. Here, I don't know if you can see too well, this is just another substation I want to point out, rock bolts. Lots and lots of rock bolts. So in the active kind of dig areas, it's a little less fancy. This is a four-rotor borer miner, which is actually also manufactured in Saskatoon, where I live now. They used to be made in Germany years ago. Um, again, think about how this gets into the mine. This is too big to go down in one piece. So there are actually huge overhaul shops dug underground, three, four stories tall rooms with fixed heavy equipment cranes. They assemble these underground, they overhaul them underground, everything gets done under there. There's a bit of a close up of the business end of the boring machine. This is a vehicle, it's, um, it moves, it drives, uh, and there's a lot of tech on this machine. It uh, has programmable logic controls, switches, analog telephone adapters, um, phone, it's got a phone on it, a couple of access points, and antennas all mounted to this moving machine. This is just what a cut looks like uh, after we clean it up a little bit. It's an interesting shot, also rock bolt. But after the pressure is relieved when the miner goes by, the potash actually just kind of starts to flake off the walls. You can grab it and pull it off there. They usually don't collapse unless the geologists intend it that way. In some areas, they actually dig with the intention of letting the rooms collapse behind after them. From the back end of the borer here, you can see, in this case, we had a UBNT 3 gigahertz bridge. Um, it's interesting to note that when you're 1,000 meters below the surface, it's really hard for the FCC or the CRTC to complain, or Industry Canada to complain about whatever powers or, or frequencies you're using. In this case, that bridge was the main link back to the fixed network for this boring machine. And this is an old setup, but as the borer tends to move away from the root AP, after a while, you know, we, we need to repeat the signal. So this is an old setup. We used to place a couple of 1242s in an EMA enclosure, point antennas back to back, or at 90 degrees if we went on a corner. And they're just powered by a car battery, right? We don't have fixed infrastructure in these areas because we're digging them actively. So when the battery dies, guys drive up in a Jeep, drop another battery, move the alligator clips, and take the other battery back to the shop to be recharged. Originally, years ago, there were a few instances where uh, I would have to go out to a borer which was actively mining to troubleshoot an issue. It couldn't connect back to the fixed network. And so I would console cable into the, uh, I think it was the 1310 bridges on the back of the miner at that time, and do my best to try and troubleshoot what was going on, but the miner was actively moving away from me. Of course, I'm on a short cable, so every few seconds I'd have to get up with my laptop off of this little pile of potash and scoot down and sit back down and furiously type again. We don't do that anymore. 
thank heavens. One of the projects we've done over the years is to actually put APs in the borers so that we now have the ability just to kind of drive up and be in the vicinity of the miner and have access to everything on board, whether it be the controls or the actual network equipment. So local switching, local authentication, so when the line back to the network is down, uh, we have the ability to just, like I said, drive up. And in this case, we were actually measuring the headroom because uh, the cab goes up and down on the borer, so it uh, had the potential to knock off the uh, antenna. We did end up putting the AP in the cabinet there. Oh. One final quick slide here. Uh, this is one different potash mine that I've done some work at. This is actually a solution mine. So they tried to mine underground, couldn't keep the groundwater out, gave in and said, whatever, let it flood. So now we pump the brine out of the hole in the ground uh, and we let it settle in these giant ponds on the surface. So these uh, barges had, um, we were implementing point-to-point -point bridges on them so that the barges could communicate back to the pump stations on shore. Again, a bit of a different environment for what I anticipated that I would be doing when I got into this industry. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm happy to share. If anybody wants to talk more about it, I've got lots of pictures. I can tell you lots of cool uh, stories. Uh, I'll be around after breaks. Please uh, don't hesitate to come find me. Cheers. Thanks.